We're going to explore the Sketcher Workbench's rectangular array tool in this video. We're going to look at how it works and do a quick comparison to the multi-transform tool in the part design workbench. Now let's get started. First, let's look at the basic functionality of the tool. I have already created a sketch that contains a circle which I will use for the bulk of the demonstration. We'll start by looking at the basic settings of the tool by making an array of circles. Select the circle and click on the rectangular array tool. I will explore the various options shortly, but for the moment I just want to show you how the tool works. I'll set the number of rows and columns to 3, but you can set them to different values if you wish. The maximum number of rows or columns is 99, but I found this value to be impractical. None of the options can be set parametrically, so the size of the array is fixed once it has been created. You'll notice that there is a line connecting the center of the circle to the mouse pointer. This line follows the mouse pointer. It shows you the angle of the top row of the array, and it also sets the initial distance between the rows and columns. The array will be created once you click the mouse button. You can strain the distance between the rows and columns after creating the array. The obvious thing about the array is that a large number of constraints are created which can make the sketch hard to read. This is because each element in the array is fully constrained. The large number of constraints can make it quite difficult to select individual constraints, and I find it easier to scroll through the list of constraints to find the one that I'm after. I created the array on an angle so that I could show you how to change its angle. The array has an angle constraint which you can manually change. Click on the list of constraints and scroll down until you find the angle constraint. Unfortunately, it's not always obvious which one it is, but there is only one per array. In this example, it's the first one, so it's easy to find. Double click on the constraint to change the angle. You can set the angle manually or use an expression to make it parametric if you wish. I'm going to set the angle to zero degrees. In this example, the distance constraint specifies the distance between the rows and the columns. I'm going to change the distance to 60 millimeters. You could use an expression here instead if you wish. As you can see, the array has changed size. You can help me produce videos like this by buying me a coffee through the link in the description below. All donations are used to help the channel. Now we'll look at how to make the horizontal and vertical constraints equal. You use the equal vertical slash horizontal spacing setting to make the vertical and horizontal spacing the same. It's a simple on off toggle and the distance between the elements is determined by the length of the line displayed when you are placing the array. I'll turn on the setting and place the array. A single distance constraint is used to set the spacing between the elements. Once I have located the constraint, I'll double click on it so that I can change its value. I'm going to make it 100 millimeters. As you can see, the array has changed size in both directions. Now we'll look at how to make the horizontal and vertical constraints independent of each other. The equal vertical slash horizontal spacing setting causes the vertical and horizontal distances to be the same. You can turn this setting off and control the spacing independently if you wish. I'll do that and place the array so you can see what happens. You can visually see that the distance between the rows and columns is not the same. Two distance constraints are created for the array. The distance between the columns is constrained first, followed by the distance between rows. The column constraint is relatively easy to find because it is near the start of the array's constraints. I'm going to change the distance to 80 millimeters. The row constraint is not so easy to find because it is created with the second row of elements. Obviously, the larger the array, the longer it may take you to find the distance constraint. Once I've located the constraint, I'll change its value to 100 millimeters. You might find it difficult to select the constraint you want because of the number of constraints in the array. I don't change the pick radius preference, but tightening it might make it easier for you to select constraints with the mouse. You can change the pick radius in your preferences. I'm not going to change the setting, but I'll quickly show you how to do it. You can change your preferences by clicking on the edit menu and then selecting the preferences item. Click on the selection tab. You can increase or decrease the size of the pick radius by changing its value and then clicking apply. Next, we'll look at constraining the inter-element separation. The constrain into element separation option applies constraints between the rows and columns. Turning it off prevents constraints being applied. Let me demonstrate. I'll turn off the constrain into element separation option, but leave everything else as is. You can see that the only constraints on the elements is the diameter of each circle. You can move the circles anywhere you want them since their location is not constrained. You can constrain the circles in place if you want, but I'm not going to do so in this example. Next, we'll look at the clone option. You can change the diameter of each circle in the previous examples because they have individual diameter constraints applied. You can use the clone option if that's not the behavior that you want. Let me demonstrate. 
Set the clone option to true and then place the array. You can see that the number of size constraints has been reduced significantly because an equality constraint has been applied to each circle. Changing the diameter of the top left circle changes the diameter of all circles because each circle now has an equality constraint instead of a size constraint. Now let's look at creating an array of rectangles. So far, I have demonstrated this tool using a simple circle, but it works with other shapes as well. For this example, I'll use a rectangle. You'll need to select all the elements in the rectangle before using the rectangular array tool. Make sure that the clone option is selected and place the array. Change the height of the rectangle to 45 millimeters. The height of all rectangles has been changed. The number of constraints created has increased significantly because the array is more complex. Processing time has also increased and I expect that FreeCAD will also take longer to open or save the model as well. Now we will have a look at the performance of the tool for creating larger arrays. I'm going to create a grid of 40 by 40 circles and then use the pocket tool to create pockets for the array. You'll have to take my word for it, but this test took around 50 minutes to complete on my five year old PC. I kept an eye on the resource utilization of my PC while this was running. I expected that the CPU performance would shoot up and FreeCAD kept one CPU core running at 100% for most of the duration. I also expected the memory utilization to go up significantly. The reason for this is that the tool made 1600 copies of the circle along with all the constraints required to make the array. Now let's compare this to the multi-transform tool. I created a circular pocket and then used the multi-transform tool to create the same sized array of pockets. It took less than five minutes to complete the same task. I can't say that I see the point of the rectangular array tool. I think that it is too limiting because it is not parametric and it creates a lot of elements that need to be processed. I used a circle in the example of a large array and it created three constraints for every element in the array plus the circle itself. I can see that this tool has the potential to create thousands of constraints and graphical elements for an array of more complex elements. And the example using a rectangle created four constraints plus four graphical elements for each rectangle. 19. In fact, my original test for the large array was for a 50 by 50 array and FreeCAD consumed 12 gigs of RAM before giving up and aborting the array. I also discovered that a sketch this large significantly increases the time taken to perform other operations on the sketch. So I doubt that I'll use this tool regularly in my work because I don't usually need to create arrays of features in a sketch. I think that I'd be more likely to use the Part Design Workbench's multi-transform tool to create an array of features. What do you think? Would you use this tool? Let me know in the comments. Check out the videos on the right to learn more about FreeCAD. The Part Design Workbench playlist contains many videos about the tools in the Part Design Workbench. If you like what you're watching, please consider buying me a cup of coffee. Your donation will help improve the channel. I hope you found this interesting. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.